Okay, we're on session 10, can you believe it? It's been two and a half months in this book already. So um, let's pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new day. As we think of Velma with you, we're grateful that she is where she is, fully enjoying to the max her relationship with you and her relationship with her husband and others that have gone before. Father, we also thank you that you've chosen to give us another day of life and that we can be here together in fellowship around your word. And we just ask that you help us to grow and that this would be a profitable day for you and for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking at the book of Romans today. Um, in 10 words or less, sinners are saved by faith, only by faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a point that uh, he will just nail down and, and hammer on that nail all through the book of Romans. The category, we've switched now from... Um, we're not in the Gospels or biographies, and we've finished with the church history, one whole book. So now we're in the epistles or letters. So the book, this book of the Bible, Romans, is a letter written to the members of the church in Rome. Uh, we saw at the end of Acts, in Acts 28, 14, we learned that Paul arrived safely in Rome, and so did Luke. Uh, they had that shipwreck, they were on the island, the people there took care of them, gave them all kinds of provisions, whatever they needed, they said, and they sailed on, and they arrived safely in Rome. And almost immediately, Paul began sharing his testimony with the readers of the Jews. I think it said after three days, Paul called them to meet with him. And then Paul ended up, the very last verse of Acts tells us that Paul was in Rome for two full years. And during that entire time, he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. At some point, he wrote this letter. Actually, I didn't look to see whether he wrote it before he got there or in anticipation of being with them or... Anyway, he wrote this letter, which is actually a theology book. And the point that it deals with, it explains the gospel, and the doctrine of salvation very clearly and very thorough. In fact, we're going to look at a little tract uh, that was written from the book of Romans, but before we do that, let's look at the introduction. It's always good for any of these books to see what they said at the very beginning, because they usually tell you <laughs> what they, why they're writing. And uh, <clears throat> we learn a lot in these first seven verses, so let's just read that and then we'll go and make some observations from it. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> And I take it off because that was all one sentence. I don't know if you noticed that. It's full of commas, but it's all one sentence. And so I've given you the answer now to the first set of blanks. So some observations. These first seven verses are comprised of only one sentence. And uh, in the very first verse of this little opening thing, Paul establishes his own credentials. In other words, he tells you who he is and why he's, what qualifies him to write with authority on these things. So he says three things about himself. He says he's a servant of Jesus Christ. And you just think what an amazing thing that is, that this man that hated Christians and was throwing them in jail and actually killing them if he could, he's now a servant of the very one who was persecuted. 
And it says not only that, he's called to be an apostle. But God gave him great authority. And not only that, but he's set apart. He's a special, his a special assignment, if you will, is the gospel. But God entrusted him with the gospel and proclaiming it everywhere he went. And that's exactly what he did. So those first, that first verse establishes who he is. And then the next couple of verses, three and four, explain who Jesus is. We see that... Um, He's God's son. We see that not only was he God's son, he was descended from David according to the flesh. He became human, if you will, and was in that royal line. And he was declared to be the son of God with power by his resurrection. And he's our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship and so on. So he tells you many facts about Jesus Christ in this opening thing. And then last of all, he talks about who we are as believers. He was talking to the church at Rome. And now he's also talking to us today. And who are we? We are people who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. We are not left out of the family. We're called to belong. We are loved by God the Father. And not only that, but we're called to be saints. That is, he wants us to be holy called to be saints. And then another observation I made later, it's not on your paper, but we also see the Trinity very clearly in this opening statement. You see God the Father mentioned in both verse 1 and verse 7, it says that Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. And we know that's God the Father because he goes on to say concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? And then last of the very last verse says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Obviously, it mentions the Son in several contexts there. And then God the Holy Spirit was mentioned in reference to his resurrection. So the Trinity is mentioned there. Okay, some patterns that you will find as you read the, any of Paul's writings, but in this book, long sentences. We've already seen it opens with a long sentence. And I call call these sentences superfoods full of nutrients for the soul. You've heard of superfoods. Beets are a superfood, special good for you. Uh, blueberries are packed with antioxidants. Now, I wouldn't know an antioxidant if it marched down the street and shook my hand. I had to look it up to even see what it is, and it has something to do with keeping your cells from damage or whatever. But anyway, all I, I do know that I've been told that blueberries are packed full of them. Well, Paul's writings are like that. They're just packed with truth and things that will nourish your soul as you meditate on them. Another pattern that we will see not only in Romans, but in almost all of his epistles, is that first he gives doctrine or teaching. In this particular book, it's on salvation. But he'll give doctrine. So I think the first 11 chapters of Roman are all doctrine. And then he gives application of the teaching. So the last few chapters have application. They have greetings and, and so on. And you'll find that is true in Ephesians. You'll find that's true in Galatians and the other epistles that he wrote. He gives teaching first, and then he tells you how to live it out in your life. And then he always expresses love. For his readers. He's just a very, these people have become dear and precious to him. And even ones that he hasn't met yet. <laughs> He's been praying for them. He loves them. And he will express that in his letters. You don't have to figure it out. He just flat out tells you that he cares about you. So just some good patterns that we will see in this book and other books. Um, <coughs> how many of you have heard of the Romans Road? Salvation. Okay, a couple of you have. This was a tract that came out a number of years ago, and it's called the Romans Road because every single proof verse in it about steps in salvation come from the Book of Romans. And I couldn't remember all of them. I knew that it was 323 and 623, but I couldn't remember what the others were. I thought, well, I'll Google it. Maybe it'll be out there somewhere. Ha! Ah, 
somewhere. There were at least a hundred versions of it, I think. There was one of the kids that had all these cute little illustrations to help them understand these concepts. Uh, some of them had like Roman soldier uh, equipment on them because it's the Romans, really. One of them had a highway kind of diagonal across the sheet. Anyway, I chose this one because one, it was kind of simple. And even though the print is small, doing it on a half sheet, it is very clear. So if you get out your magnifying glass, you'll be able to read it. But I thought this was handy to have. Now, the reason I'm giving this to you, well, let me read um, the paragraph at the bottom, and we'll talk about it. This was a very popular track some years ago, and it's still available on the <laughs> internet in many forms, including that one special, at least one, maybe there's more than one, but I saw one for children that provides cartoon graphics to illustrate the main points. I wanted to share it with you because it clearly explains the truth that someone has to understand in order to put his or her faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And as you can see, there are seven statements of truth, like uh, God is the creator and ruler over all. Number, statement number two, no one is righteous. Statement number three, we have all sinned and fall short of his standard of perfect, true righteousness, our full righteousness. Um, each of those truths is backed up by a verse from Romans. So it's not just man's opinion, but this is what God says. Now the reason I'm sharing it with you um, is so that this is a tool in your toolbox. If you have someone that you've been praying for, and an opportunity for spiritual conversation arises, this is something that you can explain to them. But I also want to give a word of caution. Our culture has changed vastly since this track came out. Nowadays, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, I'm fine, I'm good. You know, that's fine, you want to believe that. People don't have a sense of their sinfulness. So they're not, this is not going to make any sense, because if you don't know that you're a sinner, that your life is messed up somehow, you don't need a savior, right? So, but there will be those people that you have, and not everyone, this is not something that you just walk up, that you start talking about with on, on the plane to the person you're sitting next to, or that you meet in the elevator or something. This is something for somebody you have a relationship with and that you've earned the right to share spiritual things and maybe they have opened up and they've shared a need and that opens a door. I just wanted you to have this tool because if you ever are able to share, if you have somebody that knows they need Christ or they need something, then this shows you how, what to share with them and it gives you the scripture because it's the power of the scripture and the Holy Spirit who can change your heart. So I wanted you to have this tool in your toolbox. Um, next, I read, just started to read a book. Um, let's see. Sue, you went to the ladies' meeting. Uh, that would be a week ago, Saturday, out of the Impact Center. Mm -hmm. The lady that I sat next to when I was eating lunch uh, actually goes to church in Brighton, but as we got talking, she was saying that she has a burden to reach out to her neighborhood, to her neighbors. And I said, oh, that's interesting, because Tom and I are thinking that. We just had this big chimney project, and as a result, some, well, several of our neighbors came over, and we took little, and they helped us, and we gave them thank you gifts and so on. And we'd like to build on that and see if there's some way we can have an impact on the culture of our neighborhood. So she says, oh, I'm reading this wonderful book. It's called Bless, and it's an acrostic, B-L-E-S-S, -S, with a you know, dot after each one. And it just gives very practical ways to engage your neighbors and build relationships. So I downloaded it to my Kindle, <laughs> started reading it. This is really rich. So now I've ordered a hard copy because I like to be able to go and mark. And, and I'm really... I, I want to share some of those principles with you. Like the B stands for begin with prayer. Remember we read in Luke how Christ spent a lot of time in prayer for any major event that was coming up. So you, sh you should be praying for whoever it is that God is laying on your heart. 
And then the L is, oh, I can't even think of what it is. Um, it has to do with love. My mind totally blanked out. E stands for eating. Have them in for a meal, have a cookout, or go out to a restaurant, or invite them over for coffee and cookies, or something, mm -hmm. you know, just to, because there's something about eating together. Mm -hmm. And you, and then they went back to Jesus' life. How often did you see Jesus eating with people? All the time. All the time. He was either invited to like a wedding, and you know, got actively involved in that little crisis, or he was providing the food, like feeding the 5,000, or having that little breakfast on the beach for mm -hmm. the guys after his resurrection. Or he, or he would invite himself, Zacchaeus, come down, I've got to stay with you today, which means, Give me something to eat, too. You know, that's just part of the culture. Jesus used eating evangelism, if you will, a lot. And uh, the Pharisees noticed it because he wasn't always that particular, if you will, about who he ate with. But he ate with people with whom he wanted to have a close relationship and to share truth. So eating. And then the S stand, the first S is for serving. Find ways to be a help to the people that God has laid on your heart? How can you serve them? Or have they served you? And you can express your gratitude to them for that. And then the last is sharing your own story. You know, you can share a Bible verse and they may say, okay, that's good for you. But when you share what God has done in your life, that's real. And they can't dispute it because you know it happens, you know? So just some very practical things, and then they give you um, scriptures to kind of validate what they're saying. So I just thought, I, I want to, as I'm reading more this week, I'll share some more of that with you, so you'll have that little uh, thing in your toolbox as well. Do you remember who that book is by? Uh, two brothers, uh, Rick and Don, and I can't think of their name, but I'll find, I'll tell you next week. For sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but if you if you just look up B L E S S, it'll yeah, come up. That's what I did. And uh, but very practical, very helpful. You talked about um, and almost two groups of missionaries, <clears throat> two different organizations, I guess, but went to some country, and one of them their purpose statement or their goal was to make converts. The other one, their purpose statement or their goal was to be a blessing to the people that they would encounter. At the end of two years, whoever this tracking group was tracked their results, the convert group had one convert. The blessing group had 48. Wow. Almost 50 times as many. And when you think about it, <clears throat> way back when the gospel was beginning, say back with Abraham, what did God tell Abraham? He said, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to all the nations. And he, that's what God does. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people. We're not meant to be buckets just to hoard all these blessings and just keep them. We're meant to be rivers where they come down and they just flow right out of our lives to everybody around us. I, I thought, and the, all of these illustrations came from that book. I just thought, they really, they're pastors. And that, it's neat, they co-pastor a church in Chicago, a great big one that has several campuses, I think. But um, they haven't lost their touch with the people. That's good. And they, they talk about, when in their youth, they tried everything. You know, they tried, you know, tracks like this. They tried the four spiritual laws and it just always fell flat, you know, and they said, Lord, what, what are we doing wrong? You know, we want to serve you. We want to share the gospel and nobody's listening, you know, nothing's happening. And then God began to open their eyes to this thing of being a blessing, be a blessing, be a blessing. And then God was the same, you know. So anyway, this is a good book to put that, those little plugs in, because the Romans is all about the gospel. And in fact, that brings us now to your assignment, and if you'll see, you've got some coloring, using your colored pencils again. So I've given you a, 
a large portion of Romans chapter 3, and you're looking for three big words that have to do with big in the terms of they have to do with salvation. One is righteous or righteousness, and then you're also looking for the opposite of that. It also talks about being unrighteous and unrighteousness. Um, you're going to look for faith, because as Paul will nail home, salvation comes through faith. So you're going to be looking for the phrases that faith is found in. And then you're going to be looking for forms of the word justified. Being just, or justified, or the justifier. So three big words that have to do with salvation. So um, that, and then continue to uh, get a chance to kind of skim through Romans and just kind of see how those patterns play out. But for now, we will transition and go back to Exodus. And we're starting on page 84 of the workbook, week 6, page 84. Um, and as you know, if you've done any of the homework, we're getting into the plagues. So this week and next week, we're going to be looking at the first nine. Actually, um, we're going to look at the first two, that's what Jen covers today, and then the other seven she will do, or will listen to next week. Um, what happened, let's go down to question three on page 84. In chapter seven of Exodus, verses eight to 13, this is when Moses and Aaron are actually confronting Pharaoh and Aaron throws down his staff and it turns into a snake and so on. What happened when they did, gave that sign? The Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate. Okay, they were able to replicate it, but the Moses brought a the magician. So yeah, now I'm not food. Now that would have been a slap in the face, you know, because you think, what was that rod a symbol of? Authority. So who has the most authority? <laughs> the one that can eat all the other snakes, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so that one kind of backfired on the magicians, even though uh, Pharaoh didn't take it to heart, and he just turned, turned on his heel, you might say, and stomped mm -hmm. off. Okay, then um, the next few pages are marking, 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 marking. Um, but she asked you to notice all this repetition. Uh, what time of day were they going to meet with Pharaoh? In the morning. In the morning, early in the morning, yeah. And it says, go to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh, uh, and most of them. So on page 86, why do you think there was so much repetition? And why all this very structured way of writing about these plays? Any ideas? I know that. Thanks. Things got worse. <laughs> Things got worse. Okay, and so to help with remembering, I repetition helps you remember things. Yeah, we had talked about that in Genesis. You know, the the, the creation account and other things. There's a lot of repetition mm -hmm. in the genealogies. There's patterns that occur over and over. And again, because though the people of Moses' day didn't have this, they didn't have a book they could hold in their hands and refer to. So the repetition helped to remember, but you are right in your observation, things <laughs> just kept getting worse and worse, and in fact, Jen will reference that in her talk today. Um, so let's see, on day three, you, we begin to see Mo some, the first few times, Moses just hardened his heart and refused to let the people go. But then there were times when he promised to let them go and then reneged on his promise. Every time he reneged on his promise. Or he'd say, well, you can go with these calves and okay. stop he, here. He tried to negotiate. First of all, it was just, okay, the men can go, but leave your little kids here. Nope. Okay, you all can go, but leave your livestock. And then he just got mad and said, just get out of my presence, you'll never see my face again. <laughs> Says, you're probably right about that one, <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, so he's bargaining and bargaining, but in any event, he never keeps his word. How about Moses? 
What did you notice about Moses? He kept his word. He kept his word. Uh, when Mo uh, when at the frogs, when Pharaoh said, please, please, please ask your Yahweh to get rid of the frogs. Okay, what? You set the day. I'll do it on the very day you say. Tomorrow. And he kept his word. But unfortunately, Pharaoh did not. But Moses showed himself to be a man of integrity. Mm -hmm. That when he said something, he actually did it. So he was a good representative of his God, who always keeps his word at the set time. So um, that's basically what we'll cover. Next week we'll look at days four and five. We'll just fill in the chart on all the plagues and she'll have a few more questions. <coughs> but we'll go to the Jim Walton video.